there's that phrase in the chant when you're spreading thoughts of goodwill to yourself, may I look after myself with ease. And as with all the thoughts of metta for yourself, it's not selfish. Think of times in the past, or sometimes there are times in the present when you're with someone you love and they're suffering and there's nothing you can do about it. They're making themselves suffer. And yet they're beyond your reach. It might be a small child, someone who's old and very sick, or someone who's really set in his or her ways of thinking and is not about to change them. When you see that, it really hurts. That's where you have to exercise equanimity. But it's also a useful lesson to turn around and reflect on yourself. You don't want to ever be in a situation where you're suffering and you're beyond someone else's reach. In other words, you don't want to put them in that difficult situation. So you do that by learning how to take, after, take care of yourself properly. This is what we're doing as we meditate. We're learning how to look after the mind, to see where it's causing itself unnecessary suffering, unnecessary pain, stress, and to look more deeply into it. What are we doing? Why do we go for that stress? It's interesting, the Buddha says, you try to exercise dispassion for the craving that causes the suffering. And you're also supposed to comprehend the suffering itself. And at the point he says, well, what is comprehension? Comprehension is seeing things to the point of dispassion and disenchantment. So we're passionate for our suffering, as he says. We're enchanted with our suffering. There are things that we really like, and yet are the same things that make us suffer. So as you meditate, you want to pull yourself away from a lot of the things that you normally look to for happiness, that you normally look to for pleasure, so you can learn how to see them with new eyes. As you stay with the breath, you can put down a lot of narratives. It's good to put down as much as you can. One of the common questions you hear in the forest tradition is when the mind gets really still and you ask it, who are you? And you look at it, what do you see? There's nothing male or female about it, nothing white, nothing black, nothing Asian. It's just the mind. It's just awareness. You want to get to that state of stillness where you're at least somewhat outside of yourself, outside of your ordinary narratives, outside of your ordinary ways of looking and defining yourself. Take some time to rest there, get a sense of strength, and then you can turn around and look at your life. And if you can manage to see it from a new direction with a new perspective. There are times where you can actually see right through some of your old habits, your old likes and dislikes. And see the stress and disturbance and suffering they entail. And decide that it's not worth it. That's when you let go. It's when you see that it's not worth it that there is an alternative. And John Sawat often commented that the things we like are the things that make us suffer. If you want to look for where suffering is, don't look any farther than the things you like. Look into them. And when you see the suffering there, you see the stress. Then you ask yourself, is it worth it? And there will be voices in the mind that said, of course it's worth it. What else is there in life? So again, this is why we have the concentration, is to give you an alternative. 
because for most people, as the Buddha pointed out, the only alternative to pain is sens sensual pleasure. So the whole purpose of practicing concentration is to give you another escape from pain, another alternative, so you can put things into perspective. You can learn how to question those voices that say, well, what else is there? You can say, well, here is, some, here is something else. A sense of well-being that doesn't have to depend on central pleasure at all. This is how you learn how to look after yourself. You don't let yourself stay in your old dichotomies. That if there's no pain, well, you have to go for sensual pleasure. The same as with the old dichotomy. If I bottle up my anger, I'm going to get cancer, so I better let it out. That's a false dichotomy. There's a third alternative, which is to notice how the pent-up energy in your body can be released by the way you breathe, by the way that you manage the breath energy in the body. You can disperse it so that you don't have to bottle it up, and at the same time you don't have to let it out. It's a much more skillful alternative. This is a lot of what the Buddha's teachings offer, alternatives, ways of stepping out of your old habits of thinking it either has to be this or it has to be that, neither of which is especially skillful. He said there always is a skillful alternative. The whole reason we listen to his teachings and listen to the teachings of the Ajahns is they give us alternatives that we, on our own, probably wouldn't have thought of. So that we really can learn how to look after ourselves with ease and, at the same time, make that a gift to others, because our way of looking after ourselves doesn't place any burden on others at all. Then, as we get older and as we get sick, and we get more and more beyond the reach of other people, we won't give them any cause to worry. So as always with the happiness the Buddha teaches, it's a gift to yourself and a gift to other people. <laughs>